what I'm going to do here, and we're just changing up a little bit because we do have a special guest uh, who I, I've asked to just make a few introductory remarks. Uh, and I have not introduced the panelists because Walter is going to do that. Uh, but they're going to come up after, uh, after a few remarks, and I'll let Walter introduce each panelist. But of course, there are our guests of honor, so I'll let them get the proper introduction. Uh, and, and in the meantime, I'm going to uh, welcome uh, to the podium a, a great friend of the City Club and a, a huge champion for, for Chicago's youth and uh, the CEO of the Chicago Public School System, Pedro Martinez. <laughs> Thank you, Pedro. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Come on, you can do a little better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We got a model for our amazing students here. So first of all, you are in for a treat. Uh, and, and I got to say this, because I was just with the mayor in, at one of our schools. He would be proud that the West Side is represented today. So, you know. I want to thank our uh, two of our philanthropic partners, Crown Family Philanthropy and Pritzker Putzker Family Foundation, both for helping us and supporting this event. So let's give them an applause, everybody. And I and I at least I saw at least a couple of our board members that I just wanna I just wanna make sure we call them out. Our amazing board president, John Ann Shi. Thank you, sir, for being here. And our other, uh, one another amazing board members, Rudy Lozano here. Thank you, sir, Rudy, for being here. I'm just, wanna, I'm just trying to scan the room if there's any, any other board members here. Just want to make sure. You know, buddy, Adam. Thank you, Adam, for being here, our chief of staff for the board office. Um, and like I said, everybody, you're in for a treat. You know, I can't wait. We've started already announcing some of our results for last year, and I can tell you the system has never been stronger. At the same time, we still have some of the greatest needs that we've ever seen. And one of the things you're gonna hear us talk a lot about, especially during the school year, is about what we, our vision for the daily student experience in every one of our classrooms. And it's, it's not only academic, it's also around uh, social and emotional uh, learning, it's also about mental health, it's about being holistic, and then the topic today, safety. And everybody, we don't mean just physical safety. And by the way, I always say this to my team, it's not an or. You know, we gotta stop talking in our city about ors. It's all the above. As a, as a CPS kid from the 70s and 80s who grew up here in Chicago, Lower West Side, those experiences that I, that, that I went through shaped me. Being here in CPS in the 2000s, when a lot of change occurred, shaped me. And then I left for 12 years, came back and now, you know, really got to see where we're at today with all the challenges, of course, of our pandemic that we're still, still, uh, you know, really getting through. And so safety for us, it's also about emotional safety, about relationship, re relational trust. And I gotta say this, safety cannot be owned by CPS by ourselves. Let me repeat that, because I want you to really take this takeaway. It can never be owned by the district by ourselves. I want to thank our CTU partners here. We cannot put that all on our teachers. It just doesn't work that way, folks. Our children are thriving academically because of the amazing work of our students, our teachers, our paraprofessionals. But if we put everything on our teachers, it, the system cannot function. It just does not work. And so safety, you know, we want to we want to partner with you. We want to be holistic. Uh, you're going to hear some amazing insights. And just in case anybody's wondering, the parents, our students today, you know, we're rolling in a different way in CPS. We have students doing all kinds of activities outside of our school. So they're not absent from class today, just as an FYI. They won't need a no from me. This is all planned as part of the curriculum because we are doing so many things with student activities. Again, it's about the daily student experience. So we have students right now doing internships. They're doing, you know, job shadowing programs. They're going, they're doing events with communities. This is another amazing event where again, not only are we exercising student voice, but we want them to be part of the conversation, right? We want them to hear uh, what amazing leaders, you know, as all of you here, how we're gonna work together because again, everybody, safety is about 
partnership and it has to be all of us. So with that, uh, I'm going to bring up Walter, our amazing moderator, our moder and then we'll introduce our panel. Thank you, everyone. Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome, and we're going to get the program started right now. Uh, I'm Walter Katz. I was asked to moderate today's panel, and we're going to start by me uh, inviting my good friend, Jadine Chow, to run a video, a short four-minute video, about the whole school safety initiative. So. When we speak with our children, what we hear from them is that it's those trusted relationships that actually make them feel safer. Building culture and climate so that it's welcoming, that children feel safe expressing who they are and how they're feeling. Adults just have like a misperception. I don't know why, but it's supposed to be a open and shut case. You do something wrong, then you get in trouble. But I feel like if you want to get to a student, the best way is to understand them. If you're not doing okay mentally, then you're not going to be able to focus on anything else. No, every student wants to feel like they're trusted. As a queer Latina, I felt like I didn't have no one to talk to. Got picked on, I got bullied, of course. But I really didn't have no outlet, and it felt very, like, alone. We want to make sure that it's not just physical safety. It's really about alternate strategies that will help measure and promote the social-emotional side of safety. In doing so, we're seeing calmer climates, uh, we're seeing safer climates, we're seeing fewer incidents. We're seeing fewer disciplinary outcomes like fewer suspensions and fewer expulsions. One of the things that we tried to do in this process is make sure that we were hearing and centering the voices of our students. I wanna be part of it. I wanna make a change. For example, having social workers, counselors, or therapists, or like someone that understands students will make sure they feel safer. Just having someone they could trust and talk about their own personal stuff is very beneficial to help students to feel like they're not alone. So the principal asked us to be a part of the whole school safety team. We've implemented several rooms for all types of stress-related situations. And it definitely helps with students who are in distress and need to like have an outlet to just, you know, be at peace from whatever they're going through, whether it's inside of school or outside. You know, the resources that were going towards like the SROs kind of went more for like the counselors, the like youth intervention specialist. It kind of just focused more on like students' well-being. It's kind of made the school feel more like a community. A veces las prácticas que se estaban haciendo no eran del todo positivas y con buenos resultados. Yo creo que hay otras maneras de resolver los conflictos. Puede uno resolver los problemas desde la raíz. Y muchas veces cuando los estudiantes escuchan uno a otro y saben de los problemas que están pasando, Ellos se comprenden mejor, se, se empiezan a, a comunicar mejor. No solamente la escuela es más segura, sino que también creo que hay niños más felices. As an LSC member, um, the board um, looked for um, safety alternatives to put in place in the school. So we hired some more security officers. You know, having security guards there instead of SROs. A lot of those security officers are parents, and some of them do have kids in high school, so they know what's going on with those students and take them under their wing. There's a lot to work on, a lot of more issues, but overall I feel like it's going in the right direction. It's growing, it's blooming. I always think it's like, it's like a flower, like a rose, like how it starts from a seed to a rose, blooming. And there will always be a need for continuous improvement. We are seeking to expand the whole school safety planning process to other schools, including elementary schools. Our big ask is please get involved. That's how you can help make sure that our schools and children have a great way to thrive and be successful. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm gonna do the Pedro thing. I can't hear you, do it again. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jadine Chow, and I'm the Chief of Safety and Security for Chicago Public Schools. Um, we're so honored uh, I'm grateful for you to come today and support our efforts. Um, I don't know if you heard, but this event was sold out. How do you like that? We're so excited about that. Um, when people hear school safety, when you think about what your children go to, for those of you who don't have children, nieces and nephews who go to school, there's an explicit expectation that when you send your children to school, that they will be safe. That when they walk through those doors, that their teachers will be safe. Um, we agree, this is absolutely our top priority at Chicago Public Schools. But in Chicago Public Schools, we have a way of approaching our safety. And that's what we're gonna share with you today, our blueprint for how we look at school safety, which we think is very unique and very trailblazing. I have to start today really quickly by acknowledging a lot of people who had a big role in this effort. Um, first of all, starting by thanking our board members. Um, we have two today already, uh, President John and Xi, as well as Rudy Lozano. Our board members have challenged us tremendously to really push the envelope on how we think about breaking beyond the status quo. In addition, CEO Martinez has been us from the very beginning on this. We appreciate his support, um, as well as my other CPS colleagues around the room. You know who you are. Um, Civic Consulting Alliance, who helped us develop this process, along with Dr. Sonia Anderson from Embark. Um, in addition, University of Chicago, I saw you at a table over there. Thank you always for your continued support. CTU, my partners over here, um, couldn't do it without you guys. Um, but most importantly, I want to thank those on the whole school steering committee, some of whom you'll meet today on the panel. We've been partnering with five community-based organizations, uh, Voice Communities United, um, uh, Mikva Challenge, Kofi Power Pack, Build Chicago, and Arc of St. Sabina, all of whom are in the room today representing. Um, they have stayed with us since 2020 when we started. And for those of you who work with CPS, that's a, that's a good marriage. <laughs> it's four years, um, we are going strong, and we're really, really grateful for that work. Um, their dedication is unmatched, and I will say without them, we would not have accomplished what we're gonna be sharing today. So now I wanna share a very quick presentation. I know y'all wanna hear from our young people and from our panelists, but really quickly, gonna go into the presentation um, so first of all, CPS has really worked hard to go through um, our um, restorative shift. What does that mean? In 2011, 2012, we were actually a zero tolerance district. For those of you who don't know, understand what zero tolerance means, it means that there are automatic disciplinary consequences if you commit a certain infraction. Imagine if something you did automatically meant that you were gonna be put into an out of school suspension. There wasn't really much of a chance to discuss it. So since that time, thanks to our partners, some of who you'll hear from today, we really pushed the envelope on transitioning our organization from one of zero tolerance to one that's restorative. Um, this effort is built upon our commitment to making sure that we are putting our student experiences at the forefront of everything they go through every single day. So what is our vision? Um, again, thanks to our board in 2020. At the time, it seemed a little painful, but they passed a resolution saying, we really want the district to be challenged to think about an all-inclusive way of how to think about how we approach school safety. And so they passed a resolution in August 2020, which is where we're headed um, with our whole school safety planning process. So in the past, while we've relied on traditional safety strategies, things y'all know, security officers, cameras, all of those things still play a role. But in addition to that, we wanted to reimagine a new way that then engaged our stakeholders, our students, our teachers, our parents, to make sure that they were part of those um, solutions in a way that we've never done before. And that's what you're gonna hear about today, our whole school safety planning process. So as I shared, these are the names of the organizations. Um, I'm not gonna say them again, but they're up there. And again, we're so grateful. And you'll hear from some of them today on our panel. So what is the whole school safety planning process? For those of you who heard us talk about this in the past, for like a broken record, it's not just physical safety. I think a lot of people really come into this, if something happens, the first thing they think about is, we have to fortify the school, we have to harden the school. I know that's sort of, maybe there's an tendency to do that, but we know now it's so much more than just making sure the doors are locked. It's about making sure our children feel welcome. And that's the emotional safety. How do we make sure that our children, when they come into the building, that they feel safe, that they feel welcome, that they know that they have a place and that they belong. 
And how do you do that is the last leg of it, which is relational trust. We believe strongly that every single one of our students should have at least one trusted adult that they have a relationship with so that if something should happen, they have somebody that they trust that they can go to for additional support. Or in addition, if they're not comfortable saying it, that that trusted adult knows them well enough to say, hey, I see you. What's going on? Tell me, is everything okay? That is what is going to make our school safe. So as part of this process, which you'll hear about uh, again today, we've really worked hard to make sure that we are involving all of our stakeholders in developing a plan at a school level, because we know that this is not a one size fits all. Different communities have different cultures, have different um, philosophies. We wanna make sure we're pushing the envelope while heading in a certain direction, but that we're also respecting where schools are at, this, at the moment in time. One of the things that comes with their um, decision is, do we keep the police in schools? If you all remember, in 2020, that was a really big thing going around around the country. It's still a big conversation. It's a very complicated conversation. But we're very proud to say we worked with our school communities, and you'll hear from some of this today, that we asked them to divine their own destiny. And so as a result, you'll see that um, over the years since 2012, we have seen a 66% reduction in the number of school resource officers, that's full-time uniformed CPD officers inside of our schools. I wanna be really clear, this does not mean we don't need a partnership with CPD. I absolutely have to have that partnership with CBD. Our principals have a good relationship with them. By the way, I wanna congratulate uh, Superintendent Snelling um, for his recent appointment. He has been a tremendous partner over the years in his previous post and, and now in his new post. We need their support. The question is, what is the role they play every day, five days a week, eight hours a day? That's what we're talking about when we think about whole school safety. But you can see over the years, schools have decided on their own. This is not CPS saying you've got to do this one way or another. We have worked with school communities to make that decision. And so how do they do that? So we say, you can trade in your SROs. And so if you turn in that SRO, you can purchase or reinvest in alternate systems of safety. And so in partnership with the community organizations, our steering committee, we came up with a list of eligible investments that schools could choose from. Here's an example of some of the things that schools were able to choose from. So if you trade in your SRO based on your equity index, which is depending on a bunch of factors, including what's going on at your school, people at schools decided they wanted to purchase a climate and culture coordinator. Um, they want to purchase a security officer, that's okay. Um, Rich Order of Justice Coordinator, a Youth Intervention Specialist, um, MTS Coordinator, and Social Worker, et cetera, et cetera. Some schools purchased a Safe Passage Program, which we love. Um, also, some schools wanted to buy professional development. These funds are recurring. So when you trade in your SRO and you get that recurring amount, you can reinvest because this is not a one and done. We wanna make sure if you're going to use a youth intervention specialist like Mr. White at Austin, we wanna make sure that we give him the time to do what he needs to do. He's not gonna finish this in one year. It's an ongoing effort and that's how we're gonna keep students safe. So how's it going? You wanna see the results so far. All right, so the last school year that we have full year data for um, is school year 22. Um, this is, again, going back a couple years, but we're still working on uh, finalizing our data now. But look at these results. If you look at the aggregate, there's two lines here, one for high school and one for elementary school. For our high schools, we've seen a 75% reduction in out-of-school suspensions taking place at our high schools and an 86% reduction taking place in our elementary schools. Can we get a round of applause for that? That is the result of hard work done at the school level. Our school leaders, our principals, our partners, our teachers, our social workers, our security officers, everybody plays a role in that effort. Really excited about that. Expulsion's even better. 71% reduction in expulsions happening at high schools, 96% reduction in expulsions happening in elementary schools. We, I like to say we put the expulsion department out of business. It's a committee now, it's not a whole department on expulsions. And it's important to note what we're doing here is keeping our students in the classroom and that's how we're keeping them safe. And the last category is police notifications. So we've changed policy. Um, 
you can only call the police and get into CBD supports this when it's a police matter. We're not going to involve police in situations that are not police matters. That's not helpful. And that doesn't make our children feel safe. So police matters include things like criminal activity, things like a situation that's above and beyond what the school can handle. And again, by doing so, our goal is to eradicate the school to prison pipeline. And again, we see these tremendous results. And so, a lot of work still to be done. While we've seen these results, these exclusionary disciplinary actions are not enough. We have to mitigate the disproportionate level that affects uh, students of color. We do still see that disproportionality. Thanks to our friends at University of Chicago Education Labs, we've seen a recent study that just came out a few weeks ago that shows that our black male students are seeing the greatest decline in suspensions and arrests. So it's our goal to eradicate that disparity so that there's more equity in our system. And in closing, my last slide before we turn it over back to the panel, is our whole school safety theory of action. If we engage our school community stakeholders in the creation and ownership of safety vision, and if we continue to build strong positive relationships with our students using restorative practices, then our schools will serve as welcoming environments for all of our students as a place where they can feel safe, supported, and respected. And with that, I want to thank you, and we'll get back to our Well, as the, as, uh, the panelists come up and, and join us on stage, uh, let me just uh, uh, set the table uh, beyond which it has been already. So again, I'm Walter Katz. Um, formerly, uh, I was uh, in Mayor Emanuel's administration as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Public Safety uh, from uh, 2017 until the end of his term in 2019. And in serving that role, uh, uh, Jadine and I spoke in person, weekly, they meet on the phone, maybe almost every day. And uh, basically, uh, there's no more um, tireless and dedicated public servant than JD. She has spent, I don't know how many years, keeping our schools safe. And she deserves a round of applause. Uh, when she came and needed something uh, from me, uh, I never said no. <laughs> Maybe I give you a hard time, okay, but never said no. And so when you called and asked me if I could moderate today's panel, of course, I couldn't say no. Thank so thank you so much for having, uh, having me take part in this, uh, in this uh, great event today. Um, you know, and, and part of that includes, you know, yes, I was in the mayor's office, and also now on the board of, of Bright Point, formerly known as Children's Home and Aid. And they've been integral in a project you helped spearhead, which is Choose to Change which brings together uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and mentorship. And just yet another example of how when you use practices which think about the whole child, the whole adolescent, of how it can really make an impact. So with those opening remarks, I'd love to introduce you, well, have the panelists introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Morgan. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Latasha Morgan Green, the proud principal of Austin College and Career Academy on the west side of Chicago. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Maria DiGilio. I'm the Youth Director at Communities United. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel. I'm a junior at George Western House College Prep. Right, Daniel. And I guess again, Jadine Chow, Chief of Safety and Security. <laughs> All right, right Jadine. Okay, so let's get this started. Uh, we have questions. Uh, and uh, so oh, I'm really right. excited to, to dig in. And I'm gonna start with M Maria, who you played such an integral role in, in, in all this, of tell the audience of how uh, the partnership between Chicago Public School Safety and Security and the community-based organizations, how it began. Tell us about that origin story. Um, yeah, so a lot of people may not know this, but um, I've been in my organization for 17 years, so I've been there since I was a teenager. Um, and I started as a youth leader, and one of my main issues was education. And in 2012, I believe, is when Jadeen came in as the chief of safety and security. And my main goal was to rally her office almost every week <laughs> <laughs> to talk about education. Um, <clears throat> so that's actually how our relationship started. I was always 
we were always pushing and they were trying their best and we never, you know, we never were really on the same page. And then the summer of 2020 was a pivotal change for us. Um, it was a time where the world was asking about what does it mean to be safe for our health in the context of COVID-19? What does it mean to feel safe um, in the context of police um, in our communities? And mm -hmm. it was also a time where people were asking, what does it mean to feel safe in a school, especially for students of color? And during that time was, you know, the national uprising around, you know, what does it actually mean for young people to be at the center of those decision-making processes to change a system that would, instead of not turning them, of turning them away, would actually love them and support them. And during that time was when Jadine and I actually had a conversation around, you know, what does a partnership look like for us? And I'm not going to lie, like, you know, I had to talk to our young folks and our young folks had questions like, how do we know that CPS will always will actually be there? How do we know that when we weigh in, they're going to actually listen? Because there's a lot of damage in the relationship there. But it took a lot of work and a lot of restorative way to actually build that genuine relationship. So when we started working on whole school safety together, I never would have imagined sitting next to <laughs> JD at this point. <laughs> Um, but it's a beautiful, authentic relationship where we can be transparent. And even though we may have not been historically on the same side, we are now. And the lesson with that is really like, it's about opportunity and it's about growth. And it's about making sure that your goal is clear and that's young people at the center of those decision making. And we back them. Yep. Okay, sister. Uh, Jadine, in preparing for, for coming here today, I, I read the draft uh, whole school safety plan report. And what really struck me of how much process there was in there, and I don't mean that in a negative way. So often, uh, when people want to make policy change, they're so focused on the what that they ignore the how. Mm -hmm. And that report is full of the how. So my question to you is, is what can others learn from the whole process all of you went through over the last couple of years? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And I'll just say, I think, again, I'm so grateful. Maria really challenged us. She and her organizers were really instrumental in helping me to really understand what it means to do true, authentic engagement. Mm -hmm. um, in learn, you know, working in the system, sometimes you sort of see things a certain way. Um, but that really has helped us to think about the how. And so when we came in together, it, you know, we're always in a hurry. Hurry, 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 get this done. We have a deadline and so forth. Everyone on the um, steering committee made sure that we were doing this engagement that was not rushed, that we had to do it right or don't do it at all. And so in doing so, we had countless meetings. I mean, it felt like hundreds of meetings where we were getting together to talk about what we were going to do with process to make sure that this was authentic. One of the things I did not want to do for them to trust in this effort is to take them all this way, only then to say at the end of it, oh, you know what, we're not doing it. I was not gonna be a part of that. And so I had to be very comfortable in updating my leadership every step of the way so that they bought in, they didn't have any concerns, or if they did have concerns, I could bring it back to the committee. In doing so, that's how we build that trust. And so again, four years later, now we're still trying to make it better, um, but it's not just with the steering committee and my team and some of the partners that we had, is really then taking it out to the school level. And so that's why we also have representatives from the schools, because it had to work for them as well. This had to be something that they felt comfortable with that would meet their needs. And how is that different from how school safety is being handled uh, throughout the rest of the country? Because no. this is unique here, I think. Yeah, I mean, this is very, it takes a lot of work. And I think, and I'm not trying to say that people aren't willing to work in other school districts. I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, though, it, it's a really big investment. I'm very fortunate that I have leadership at the board level, at the CEO level, mm -hmm. that they are willing to give us the space to make these kind of efforts and investments in time and in commitments. I think what other school districts, and I meet with them regularly, I think one thing that they can maybe observe, again, not saying it's good for everybody, but works for us, is by really sort of letting go some of your you know, ownership, if you will, um, 
by doing so, by sharing that with those who are at the center, the students, the community, by doing so, sort of very liberating. And you actually can then see, again, affecting what those who are at the center of it, what works for them. And if you're doing that correctly, then you feel much more confident that what you're doing is right. And, and Dr. Morgan, you have been leading a school site out in Austin, but taking kind of a more big picture perspective, what do you mm -hmm. see from, from, from your perspective, how it's different from how school safety is handled elsewhere? Absolutely. So like Jadine said, it was a long process, right? So we made sure that we invited all of the stakeholders to the table at some point. We had meetings with parents. We had meetings with students. I had weekly meetings with students. I had meetings with teachers. Sometimes this would take over the department meetings when we would discuss what the school safety looked like at our school. So the key piece was inviting the stakeholders in, the people who we were actually trying to keep safe, right? So they should have a voice in the safety process. And so that was, it was game changing for us because they did feel empowered when we started making the decisions. I shouldn't even say we made the decisions. Actually, I can't say we, because we all did it. The parents, the students, the teachers, um, the security officers. So that was key and that we brought everybody to the table. And so when we finally came to the decision we made, which we'll talk about a little bit later, everybody felt like they had a part in it. And so everybody bought in that's right. and that's what matters. All right. And that word you said should be like underscored and put in bold print, which is empowered. Yes. Right? And, and that is like the theme throughout this whole process of actually empowering people so right. they can actually guide what their schools, what their school district will look like. Right. Um, so this next question actually is, is for you, uh, go back to you, Maria, which is how are students and their families uh, being engaged? How were they being engaged throughout this whole process? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, and I think it's important to understand that the role of the whole school safety steering committee was to provide like the blueprint, right, of how you actually authentically engage young people and parents into the conversation that gives them enough information mm -hmm. so that they can make decisions like Dr. Green mm -hmm. was mentioning. Mm -hmm. And so the way that young people were engaged is that, you know, some principals, they had community meetings with students and parents, some did focus groups, some did, you know, any type of engagement that actually talks about what were some of the root causes and the issues based on the data of their school, you know, what were the challenges? And then what was, what was the best way to go about that? <clears throat> um, for the steering committee, the way that we involve them, and some of the students are actually here today, when they were still in high school, now they're a little bit older, so they're in college, they developed the actual you know, menu, per se, of what schools could choose from if they were going to not have an SRO. You get a certain amount of money because that's an important part of the process, right? Because we want to give schools a real choice. They got money for that and then they can choose from a menu of things that they could spend it on. And that menu was co-developed with young folks all across the city from Voice, from Mikva, Build, Arkham St. Sabina and Kofi Power Pack. Um, and those included uh, you know, the interventions, the social emotional learning programs and everything else in between. Great. And Daniel, uh, being a student, from your perspective, why is it important to bring students uh, to have a say? in the process and what they want to see in safety? Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to bring students to the table because it makes us feel empowered. Like it makes our opinions feel like they're being valued. Yeah. And for us to say, oh, we want this in our schools, or we want this, or we don't want this, it allows us to create this community within our school. It makes us want to come back to school. Mm -hmm. It allows us to say, okay, if I have a say in what's going on in my school, I might be want to go more. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to really feel empowered in that space. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And that, again, there's that word, empowered, includes being included, thinking you have a say, have a role. Uh, that is so important. And so let me follow up then of what can other parts of this city other agencies learn from the whole school safety process. Um, you know, how do we center leadership around young people in the entire community of stakeholders in an authentic manner? So it's kind of a, a question for anyone here in the panel who wants to grab that in terms of what can others learn from this? I'll jump in. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it comes from really a true philosophical belief 
that <clears throat> our young people really matter and a philosophical belief that they have knowledge and a lot to offer. We at Chicago Public Schools truly believe that. It's not just something that we, you know, like study or whatever. We, we really aim to live that. Um, a lot of what we do, and that comes from our top, our top down from our board to our CEO, to our principals, to teachers. Up and down, I've seen us really evolve to that. And to Daniel's point, what we've seen in return, when we involve our young people in, in not just safety, I mean, safety, of course, is my area, so I love it, but in other areas, other decisions with, through student voice, we see a much richer, connected school community, and that is what is going to make this sustainable so our children want to come every day. Anyone else want to add to that? Like, you know, Dr. Morgan, like a community like Austin, mm -hmm. nurtures needs and need for community voice in so many, so many facets of that community. Right. I was going to piggyback off what Jadine said, and that if you want people to be engaged, and to feel empowered and you want the buy-in, you have to include them in the decision-making process. It just makes sense for it not to be a top-down kind of dictatorial type of thing, right? So that is what I feel like organizations should learn. Bring everybody to the table. Get their opinion. See what matters to them because that's what increases that sense of belonging, connectedness, well-being. And that's what we're trying. This is actually in my CIWP, something that governs the way we run our school, that we're trying to increase um, connectedness and well-being within our school. That's a goal of ours. It's been a goal for a while. And so in order to have that sense of connectedness, you have to get feedback from the people that you're serving. Right? Thank you. And that really, the next question was going to be, uh, about how schools change to become more holistic. And I was really struck with the fact that for 17, 18 years, CPS was a zero tolerance environment. And so I just want to touch on that for a second. You've been in the school district for a long time. Mm -hmm. How has that changed the environment of, of, of learning and belonging by moving away from zero tolerance? Oh my goodness, it has truly been a game changer. At a school like Austin, you have to build relationships in order for the students to be successful. There's something we always say that students don't care about what you know, and so they know how much you care. And that is foundational at Austin. So our theme for like when freshmen come in, it's been our theme for the past three years is I belong. We give them t-shirts that say I belong with the little Austin symbol in our um, logo so that they understand that they are a part of this school community. Their voice matters from the beginning. Right. We have meetings and focus groups with freshmen, sophomores, mm -hmm. juniors, seniors in order to make sure that they know their voice matters. Their voices are heard on a weekly basis. This is not something we just did for the whole school safety plan. This has become who we are. Um, our theme also, in addition to I Belong, has been for every year we celebrate student successes, we cultivate, and we connect them with the caring adult in the building. So I have a list of all of my students, and I have all the organizations who partner with us. Uh, we have WOW, Youth Guidance, we have BUILD, we have Fathers Who Care, just several different organizations, or a social worker, or BHT sometimes, you know, if there's some challenges that are kind of beyond our scope, but every student is attached to a caring adult in the building, and that has made a world of difference. Well, let me follow up with you, Maria, because, you know, we're hearing how the institution has changed. Uh, people on the inside are pulling these levers who want to see something bit uh, something bigger and better. But my belief is that you cannot get that change without outside agitation. And so tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. your experience and how, how you see this transformation of, to more holistic environments and how the outside advocacy helped bring that about. Yeah, um, and I think like, you know, um, we always talk about, at least like in the work of community organizing, we always talk about how the civil rights was planned you know, and but it looks like magic, right, from the people outside. Um, and it takes a lot of skill to make something as complex as school safety mm -hmm. look natural and easy. But the reality is that, you know, it was born out of during the summer of 2020 when, you know, the murder of George Floyd happened and there were racial uprisings, not just in Chicago, but all over the nation. And school districts were being pushed to just pull SROs out of schools. Mm -hmm. But what Chicago did was different, right? We also had racial uprisings in Chicago. Our young people were part of being part of those folks who are pushing on the streets. And 
you know, historically, like, yes, Voice as our organization or Communities United wanted police out of schools. But the reality is that what we had in Chicago, what we were ready for in Chicago was a process. So when the resolution came about, the resolution came about from, you know, a lot of rallies and press conferences and all of those things that we did outside of, you know, the board office in Chicago education. Um, but the compromise was a community-led process that was brought upon with the resolution when we worked with the board to put it together, and whole school safety came about from that. So whole school safety was really born, I would say, mm -hmm. and I would argue, from young people's need to be heard. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that's actually backed by the district. Right. So it's sustainable. And that's what makes the process so much more different than any school district across the country. Because right now, three years later, a lot of those school districts are now investing $25 million in bringing back SROs, or they're just bringing them back without the community's involvement. But CPS and whole school safety has stayed that course. And three years later, we had reallocated $10.9 million from SROs to holistic approaches. That's huge. Yeah. And for Danielle, for you as a student at a school, which uh, from our conversation, my understanding is your school removed one SRO uh, from, from your school. Uh, how has that made a difference in what you've seen about the shift in how safety was approached? Um, well, within my school, there are a lot of um, already relationships with the students and the teachers and the faculty and administration. Um, so when we removed the SRO, <clears throat> I felt a greater presence with that, um, um, that connection. Mm -hmm. Like I saw more of the, um, the counselors more. I saw more of the assistant principals in the hallways. I saw um, the dean more walking around in lunchrooms trying to talk to people. It was more so them trying to get to know us and try to get to understand us as human beings and not just, oh, let's just go penalize them for every mishap they, ha they have. It was more so trying to figure out how to get to know everybody in this school so that we can become a school community and build up and be um, better. So I feel like once we removed that one SRO, it was more so now, let's try to connect with the students more. Even though they were doing that previously, it was more connection this year in these first couple of weeks that I have seen. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, My last question goes to the recommendations themselves, which is in the framework, and I encourage everyone to, is the report been published yet? Or did I see a draft? <laughs> no, that was the published, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> not sure if I was revealing anything. Uh, but within the recommendations themselves, one which really struck out for me was at the very top, talking about restorative justice practices as being at the center of this approach. Mm -hmm. And my last question is about that. Why was that so important? And for folks who may not be familiar with what restorative justice practices are, what is it? So let me start with the what, and then let's go to why is it important? Whoever wants to grab that. Okay, so in our school, restorative justice, well, just in general, restorative ju justice means just restoring the wrong, right? Getting to the root cause of what's going on and really providing support around finding the why behind the what. And at Austin, we also reduced, we went down from two SROs to one. We introduced a culture and climate specialist, which is Mr. White I have right here. <laughs> and he, you guys, he has changed the climate in our building. He does PD with our teachers. We're, we've adopted conscious discipline, right? And that is a complete mindset shift that teachers, staff, everybody in the building have to adopt where we're no longer punitive. We are restoring the wrong or whatever's going on in that student's life that's making them, um, you know, have challenging behaviors. And so basically, him being able to uh, kind of help shape the culture, be fundamental in utilizing restorative practices when things go on in the building has radically shifted the entire culture in our building. We have less suspensions now at this, what is it? I think we're 16% lower suspensions, 
We increased by 64% restorative conversations in the building. It basically forced everybody to be more creative and to really get to the root cause of what's going on with students. And we love that. And so everybody has embraced it. That has been the fundamental change that I've seen with restorative justice practices. I can go on and on about that. <laughs> we have peace rooms in the school now. We have calm, calm, safe spaces in every classroom. So we do things that make students feel safe because we heard from them what that meant to feel safe. So we knew what they needed. So yeah, it's been, it's been a game changer for Austin. Yeah. And, and I could add to that, like what Dr. Green eloquently laid out is the, base, the basics of restorative practice. It's actually something that you do that prevents the issues from happening. Oftentimes when we hear of the traditional restorative practice, we're talking about, oh, you need a peace circle because a harm has been done. Mm -hmm. The reality is that restorative practice is the philosophy is that you create deep relationships with each other. You create ownership and then you feel the need to belong and to, right. to protect that space. So restorative practice, the idea is that you create that deep relationship so you avoid having issues in the first place. And that's exactly what Dr. Mm -hmm. Green did at Austin. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone, for these great answers. I, I've, we have time uh, for, for one audience question, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll take that one and direct this to, to the separate PGD, which is what have you learned, or what has been learned about the supports that are needed for implementation? It's one thing to create a plan, to say we're going to put money into it, but they also need supports for implementation. So how, how, what have you learned about the need and how to, how to, how to provide those? I mean, it's, it's, thank you for that question, whoever asked that, because again, to some of the, just building on just the last two answers, whatever we do in Chicago Public Schools, it has to be sustainable. And so when we talk about restorative practices, and I started 12 years ago, if we just like threw it out there um, without support, without, you know, you know, just, again, the day-to-day -day interventions, like it would have failed immediately and then people would have given up. See, if restorative practices don't work. Instead, what we work to do was really take our time, and there's urgency, so don't get me wrong, but take our time to make sure every step of the way we're supporting schools with what they need. So we're working constantly with principals, working constantly with teachers, with parents, with students to understand how is it going. So if we need to make adjustments, if we need to install additional interventions, we are doing so. I think from a process standpoint, if I can give like one last like parting words on restorative practices, it works. The data shows this. Um, my conversations with young people every day shows this. People have to give it a chance. It, it is a mindset shift. I always say that. And I think that once you are in it, like you're a believer. But if you're not in it, and I, again, I talked to a lot of colleagues around the country, I think people are like, no, there's no way that could work. You really have to do it and see it work to really understand it. So that, that would be my comments. Great, thank you. The last thing I'll say, thank you to all of you. And I just wanna kind of close with this observation that you all should be really proud, not only of this effort of everyone who's involved in it, but also in general with how far uh, Chicago is coming. I mean, look at these examples. We have an example here of how do we think about school safety and do it in a way which is about de devolution of power. We see other examples elsewhere. For example, the creation of the CCPSA in, in policing and the district councils. You know, this new mindset of thinking about how do people show up as leaders and how do they share power rather than just following the headlines. Doing little important things like, for example, you know, appointed officials willingly taking on term limits. Those are all about enhancing democracy and making stronger communities and empowering people to have a voice. So thank you for everything that you do and please a round of applause for, for all the panelists. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, if you were wondering what we were doing, I guess Walter was um, being safe. If any of you all know about being on live mics, he kept pushing the button. Yeah. Turn it off. <laughs> Oh, it's like, maybe you need to hear what you're saying. <laughs> so, um, yes, for teachers and principals who were in the room, I have had four seats today. So um, I was that kid who was in all the different seats. I guess I, and I was just moving around a lot. Um, thank you all so much. Um, Dan is not here. He had to um, go to another meeting, but he would say, 
that this conversation needs to continue. Um, and as his tagline is, more to come. I believe that this group um, started the conversation. JD, thank you so, so much. And um, we have one of those um, quiet rooms, I guess is what you all call them. Yeah. And I just need to let you know, I'm a whole grown woman and I go to that quiet room mm. a lot. So I just kind of have to, <laughs> and, and, and in the corporate world, there are times when we just kind of have to, <laughs> so that we don't, you know, go someplace else. So. <laughs> um, thank you to all of the students in the room. How many students do we have that are on, what did you all call it, a field trip? How many students do we have in the room today? Oh. I saw a couple of them leave. <laughs> Stand up students. I love it. Thank you all so much for being here and thank you for um, uh, answering the call to answer and help uh, solve the problems. Because we do know that I know I could not be a student today. The principals would not want me. <laughs> no, 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 no. To Jadine and uh, Marie and Daniel, thank you so much. Um, to Walter, thank you. And next time you come, we're really going to get you a plate. <laughs> Walter said that he's been to City Club a number of times and he's either been a panelist um, speaking or doing something and has not been able to eat. And today would have been a pretty good day because we had tiramisu. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to. The tiramisu is pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah. We don't always get. There's some here. There's one that's totally untouched. What? What's wrong with you all? <laughs> Who passes up Maggiano's tiramisu? Obviously, you guys are the only ones. So, um, but thank you all so much for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, again, this conversation is to be continued. We, we have not um, even touched the, the brim of, of, this, of this issue. Um, and you've been at this how long? How many years did you say you've been in this? Uh, this is my 17th year. And you were two when you started doing it. Right? <laughs> oh I was my. 15. 15, <laughs> right. A round of applause to Maria because she's been in the fight yeah. for a long time. Uh, we had the privilege of having uh, CEO Martinez speak, uh, was it a year ago yet? About a year ago, so he's due. Um, I expect to see everyone in this room uh, here when he speaks again. Um, he said, I got this, we have answers for this. And I remember being so intrigued, so thank you for stepping up and answering the call. To all of the schools and, and the, the, the representatives, I know Dan thanked all of the um, sponsors, but we are appreciative for every single person in this room, thank you so much. And um, if you have not taken a look at our website to see what upcoming programs we have, please do so, we'd love to have you. I will encourage you, um, kind of like the manger, come early to get a good seat, because if you don't, you won't get one. <laughs> um, but we'd love for you to be here. To each one of the speakers. Oh, did I do this wrong, Amanda? <laughs> Amanda runs. There. Okay, no, 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 no. I did it right. I did it right. I did it right. So we um, are honored that you're here and you each have a year of membership to so please come back. Oh, that's Walter. Awesome. <laughs> Very sweet. Daniel, yours might work a little bit longer because you get a student rate. I don't know how that works. You have to see Amanda. Maria. Thank you. Jadine. And Dr. Morgan Green. Thank you. Thank you so Very much. Sweet. Thank you, educators. Thank you, teachers. Yeah. Thank you, general uh, Chicagoans public that's here. Um, we are giving you back your afternoon. Please go and continue the conversation. Thank you so much, and we are adjourned. <laughs>